thank you very much um, for the introduction. The notion that the Bible is humorous may be perplexing for the common reader of scripture. Natalia Brenner notes that this is partly due to the didactic content present in and the efficacious aims inherent to such works. This is a sentiment shared by much of past biblical scholarship, with the Huda uh, Rade pointedly stating that in the last 1,500 years, the majority of biblical scholars, in the seriousness of their research, have not detected the slightest touch of humour in the Bible. Moreover, the canonization of biblical texts has sacralized the works to such an extent that their seriousness obscures the implicit humour presence. The comedic nature of Esther, along with its lack of explicit piety and religiosity, resulted in its delayed and ambivalent acceptance as part of the religious canon in both Jewish and Christian circles. Alongside two of the other five scrolls, namely the Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes, Megillah Esther occupies a difficult position in scriptural reception. In the case of Esther, the work was rejected in particular for its contested historicity and lack of overt religiosity, as well as its questionable use of humour. Whilst most scholars in recent years have, however, largely accepted comic readings of Megillah Esther, others have expressed their uneasiness at finding humour in a seemingly overtly violent narrative. Erica Dunbar, in her paper on collective trauma, proposes horror as an alternative reading strategy for the Book of Esther. Contra traditional readings, which seek to categorise Esther as a court tale, diasporic novella, carnivalesque or wisdom narrative, Dunbar conversely notes that the explicit horror present in Esther acts as a means of highlighting the outrageous violence perpetrated against the female collective in the beginning chapters of the narrative, particularly the beautification process of chapter two. Generic and literary classifications of Esther thus orient the reader's focus towards certain aspects of the text while simultaneously providing a ruse for the horror of the narrator's account. This, she argues, stands even whilst affirming that such apparent humour can be a medium of critique of empire. To what extent one holds those these two readings in tandem is heavily debated. Dunbar applauds the way reading Esther with horror leaves readers disturbed and unsettled at the violence inherent to the narrative. Nonetheless, one could likewise argue that humorous readings themselves provide such opportunity. Melissa Jackson in her monograph on comedy in the Hebrew Bible notes that many readers would affirm that the Book of Esther is divided into separate and mutually exclusive chapters of frightening and funny. She, however, convincingly demonstrates that Esther is both frightening and funny, with, with both elements, while seemingly disparate, occurring together hand in hand, skillfully crafted by the narrator in their treatment of the events. It seems, therefore, that a new reading strategy must be introduced to provide a convincing explanation for the unsettling duality of humour and horror present in Esther. Black or dark comedy has been identified in the Book of Esther by scholars such as Brenner, given the quite literal gallows humour of chapter, 10, of chapter 7, verse 10. Gallows humour is the use of morbid comedy in unpleasant, often dangerous, even deathly circumstances, making extreme light of the situation. A classic example of this would be the tradition that holds St Lawrence, whilst being tortured by hot coals on a gridiron, remarked that he was done on this side, turn me over. Naturally, he is a patron saint of firefighters, chefs, and of course, comedians. Curiously, Devorah Baum observes that even the joke's own vocabulary attests that there are darker, more aggressive sides to humour. She notes, for instance, the physicality of the phrase punchline. Likewise, some, such linguistic aggression can be observed in the following terminology, side splitting, gag, to crack a joke and to pull someone's leg. However, dark humour remains an unexplored reading strategy to potentially accommodate disparate elements across the broader, broader narrative of Esther. Thus, in the following study, black comedy as a literary key for the Book of Esther will be explored. Humorous features, themes and scenes in Esther will then be analysed and the potential of dark humour scrutinised. Conducting a narrative critical reading of, Est of Esther, black comedy is proposed as, proposed as a key strategy to understand the use of the comic in Esther, as well as the author's aims in doing so. The comic makes for a rather slippery subject matter with many linguistic and conceptual problems surrounding the study of humor. Most acutely, humor by its very nature defies definition since it relies heavily on the context in which it is produced, as well as that of the reader, both assumed and contemporary. 
Thus, what one reader finds hilarious, another finds scandalous. This is keenly evident in the violent yet indisputably comic tale of Esther. The multiplicity of meaning surrounding humour gives rise to a polyvalence of interpretation. One must therefore tread an extremely fine line between intentionality and reception. There exists a curious duality between openness to humour inherent to the text at hand and a keen awareness not to read humour into a text where it is not explicitly intended. Moreover, as B.W. Jones points out, we regrettably know very little about the nature and form of humour in antiquity. The reader must therefore be attentive to the wit and skill of the narrator in works such as Esther, since the humour present in the text is often subtle or contextually marked. The vast cultural gap between the contemporary reader and author is perhaps further exacerbated by the reliance on original language in the appreciation of much biblical humour. Nonetheless, the apparent subjectivity of humour in a biblical text need not be a stumbling block in interpretation. So, as noted, commentators have long been troubled by this dual presence of comedy as well as extreme violence in Esther. Most problematic has been rec reconciling the institution of Purim in chapter 9 with the bloody massacre of the Gentiles directly preceding this. Others have also emphasised the violent, violence inherent to the beautification process of chapter 2 verses 12 to 14. Whilst this apparent genocidal act is an ironic reversal of the command to destroy the Jews, the presence of this in a biblical work remains difficult. The purpose of this juxtaposition will therefore be explored and the communicative function of black comedy in the narrative analysed. The term black comedy was coined in the 20th century and is derived from the French comedie noire. It is a narrative genre or device in which disturbing or sinister subjects are treated with bitter amusement, usually in a manner calculated to offend and shock. The Book of Esther is deeply humorous and at once extremely violent. Black comedy holds both concepts in tandem, generating both edifying and entertaining content for the reader. So in the following analysis, black comedy as a reading strategy will be proposed. Um, and the characterization of main, the main figures through intertextual comparison will be explored. In a longer version of this paper, themes and motifs across the Book of Esther are also explored. But for the purpose of this presentation today, um, I'm, I'm just going to focus on uh, characterization. So the literary craft of the narrator is evidenced by their skillful characterization. Whilst it appears that many of the figures in the narrative are pure fiction, these characters are, however, built on past literature. Like other key figures in the history of the Israelites, Esther is commended on the outset for her beauty. This characterization is found, found elsewhere in biblical literature, with Moses, Joseph, Saul, David and Judith all said to have been good looking or beautiful. In each of these narratives, this motif serves a key purpose, namely to alert the, atten to alert the attentive reader to the individual's salvific capabilities and capacities. Sabine van den Eind notes the link between Esther and King David. It notes that the link between Esther and King David is further exacerbated through the comparison of Vashti Esther to David Saul. She writes, in the same way as the handsome David replaced the good-looking Saul, Esther replaced Vashti. She is the better one. The extensive beautification process recounted in uh, chapter, chapter 2, verse 12, is perhaps also connected to the cultic wor worship of Ishtar, Esther's namesake, uh, the goddess in ancient Near Eastern um, history. Stephanie Daly speaks of a ritual whereby a statue of the goddess was perfumed with costly and exotic scents, much like we see in the beautification process of chapter 2. Many have also noted Esther's apparent passive status in the narrative. She is controlled by her husband's whim and Mordecai's decisions. This is further evidenced in the linguistic choices made by the narrator. In chapter two, verse 16, Esther is described as having been taken to the king. The narrator provides textual clues to his humor, namely the ambiguity of Esther and Mordecai's familial status. This is since, as Jonathan Jacobs has pointed out, the adoption described in verse seven may likewise be translated as taking for the purposes of marriage. This confusion is compounded due to the fact that the text explicitly states that she was taken as a daughter. Moreover, B.D. Wolfish states that this would, could, would not be possible since the text references the necessity of the virginal status of the women called to the court of Ashurus. 
However, the dual mention of virgins as well as women in verse 17 suggests that the possibility suggests the possibility that women other than virgins also participated in this beautification process. Black comedy is therefore a useful reading strategy to make sense of this confusion. The horrific and extensive nature of the beauty contest of chapter two is counteracted and contrasted by the implicit humour of the chapter. It will be charitably argued that the redactor would not have been so careless as to include contradictory statements of uh, Esther and Mordecai's familial status. And more aptly, the narrator would also have been keenly aware of this possible ambiguity and thus its comic potential. And it seems that also early rabbis were aware of this possible confusion. Through the use of black comedy, the narrator is also able to construct Jewishness in, con in contrast to Gentile figures in the narrative. Mordecai is explicitly referred to as a Jew, first as a descriptor in chapter two, verse five, and then titularly in the remainder of the narrative. Weta argues that Mordecai is presented as the ideal Israelite who guarantees that this identity will survive even under the most hostile circumstances. In chapter eight, verse 17, it is stated that the Persian people were professed to be Jews or were Judaized. This verbal denotation of the Gentiles as now Jews expresses their conversion, the reason for which is explicitly given, because the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. It is tragically ironic that the threatened genocide of the Jews, the Jewish people, ultimately results in the religious conversion of the Persian people and their integ integration into Jewish culture. Those who intend to destroy will in turn be destroyed, both literarily and seemingly culturally. This is seemingly undertaken without direct divine intervention. In this way, the narrator is able to avoid criticism of blasphemy and the narrator is able, and the reader is able to celebrate with the Jewish people their successes, but with a keen awareness of the violence that has ensued. And the joyous festivity of Purim inscribes this duality eternally. Foolishness appears to be the overarching portrayal of the king. This characterization, however, is undertaken by the narrator indirectly. The narrator shows no particular concern in developing the character of Ahasuerus. He speaks or rather acts for himself. This is demonstrated by the fact that each character, um, save Ahasuerus, is given an epithet. For instance, Mordecai the Jew, Haggai the king's eunuch, and so on. Likewise, the sharp contrast in character um, between the king and Esther further emphasises his Nash rash nature. This is apparent most explicitly in chapter seven, uh, chap chapter seven verse eight. Contra H.H. H. Friedman, who asserts that joking is not present in biblical narrative, a damning joke can be detected here. As, Joshua, as Josiah Darby demonstrates, the moment at which Ahasuerus is realizes the nature of Haman is at the possible assault of his own wife, which according to him is made worse by it occurring in my own house. Jeremy Dalber aptly notes that Esther offers the possibility of the bleakest, blackest joke in Jewish history. The idea that the fate of an entire nation depends on a simple coincidence. Concomitantly, the threat of genocide rested merely on the whim of the autocratic Ahasuerus. Vashti, on the under, other hand, is characterised without reference to past with, is characterised with reference to past tradition. Through intertextual links to the Joseph cycle, the narrator contrasts her to Joseph and Ahasuerus to Potiphar's wife. This is due to the sexual undertone of chapter one, verses eleven to twelve. In Genesis thirty-nine, the narrator tells of a similar refusal on the part of Joseph. Joseph. An intertextual comparison is made between the seemingly hypersexual figures of Potiphar's wife and Ahasuerus and the principal characters of Joseph and Vashti. Whilst we are not told of the reason for her refusal, Vashti's implicit comparison to Joseph perhaps signals nar narratorial approval of her actions. The contrast between Ahasuerus's dismissal and quite, po and quite possibly violent dismissal of Vashti in, conduction, in conjunction to the lavishness of the banquet described in chapter one and the extensive beautification process is accounted by, for via black comedy. The juxtaposition of the com comic hyperbole and the violent characterization makes for an uncomfortable but sophisticated reality. 
The motif of refusal is continued in chapter three. Just as Vashti appears before Asherus, so too Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman. The ridiculous of the situation is highlighted on two fronts by the narrator. Firstly, the obvious ex ex escalation of the situation on Haman's part, namely the drastic legal maneuver Haman undertakes to extend his personal disagreement to the political realm. Secondly, as Eilat Seidler notes, Jews are not forbidden from bowing in cases where they need to show politeness or respect to their superiors. Compare, for instance, the refusal to bow to Nebuchadnezzar noted in Daniel chapter 3, verse 12. Clear parallels exist between the verbal exchange of Haman and his wife Zeresh and that of Jezebel and Ahab in 1 Kings 21. In both narratives, the wife is portrayed as orchestrating their husband's downfall through their influence over them. Likewise, bureaucracy and letter writing play a central role in this. It is tragically ironic that in both cases, a bloody death is recounted. This is further escalated by the narrator through the later description of the de death of Haman's ten sons. The narrator could have quite easily limited the consequences of Haman's action to those immediately involved in his genocidal plot, namely himself and his wife Zeresh. However, the violence extends much further. The ironic reversal of chapter 7 verse 10 is juxtaposed with the violence of chapter 9 verses 7 to 10, and we as readers are simultaneously comically satisfied and shocked. Black comedy, I argue, satisfyingly allows for the tension, this tension of the tension of this reality. So to conclude, reading Magila Esther with attention to black comedy appears to resolve the apparent tension between the comedic features in the narrative and the vi violent portrayal of the events recounted, allowing both to be held in tandem and thus appear less problematic. Taken together, humour and horror serve a dual function, namely to edify and entertain Esther's readership. Separating comedy and violence, as many have attempted to do, so, do, seeing chapter one as highly humorous and chapter nine as devastatingly violent, not only severely underestimates the literary skill of the narrator, but misinterprets their aims. To hold that there is a sudden, sh sudden shift in tone is to misunderstand the purpose and function of the narrative. The Book of Esther is at once both horrific and humorous. The colonial power portrayed in the narrative is ridiculed doubly, specifically through humorous literary portrayal and the destructive fate of the Gentiles at the end of the narrative, in direct contrast to their intended but failed genocide of the Jewish people. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Just um, one very, very quick question for you. Uh, Karenza has asked that she'd like to see the longer paper. Where will this be available? Um, so I, it's a paper based on my MA dissertation and I'm hoping to uh, present it also at SBL in November, um, obviously with kind of feedback and stuff from people because I'm aware that there's probably a lot of weaknesses. Um, so yeah, um, after I receive feedback on it, I'll, um, I'll develop it further and uh, I'm happy to email it to anyone. And the... the the, the seminar you're presenting it at is actually IBR at SBL, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and a book will be coming out of that that uh, Trevor Lawrence and I will be editing and uh, all being well, your, your paper will be included in that book. Did you know that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you do now. If, yeah. if you want to of course. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So thank you very much, Hannah.